Okay. Well, for those of you who don't know, my name is Darren Helm. If this sermon were to have a title, it would be, Let Me Tell You Something You Already Know. Because today we'll be looking at a passage of scripture that we're all familiar with. And the problem with these passages of scripture is that we hear them so often that they begin to lose their impact. We hear the words so many times that they become just noise inside. We think that we understand it after so many repetitions that we cease to look for the meaning within the words. Today's passage contains some of the most familiar words of all scripture, all these like sheep. Whenever I hear that, I'm reminded of a story I heard from another family back home about about 45 sheep. One night a storm blew up, one of those thunderstorms that shows up very suddenly in the summer. The thunder and the lightning came and spooked the sheep. They all began to run in one direction. They ran right through a fence, over the edge of a ravine, and drowned every last one of them in a creek. All we like sheep have gone astray. Let me pray. Father, Lord, I am humbled to stand before this assembly of my peers, Lord. I am humbled that the opportunity is given me to proclaim your word. Lord, I ask that this would indeed be your word, not mine. I have nothing to offer to my brothers. Without you, I can do nothing. For you are the true vine, Lord, and I am only a branch. Your will be done. May you be glorified by everything that is said here this morning. Amen. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah, chapter 53. And although it says in your soul of us that we passages 4 to 6, I would like to start in verse 2. I think those extra two verses add something to what the prophet Isaiah is saying here. As you turn, allow me to give you some context. As Isaiah commences his ministry, the kingdom of Israel was in dire straits. The promises made to David seem to be breaking down. The kingdom is falling apart as in a decline the likes of what we have not seen. And Isaiah is sent to proclaim the judgment of God on the people. And so he does. Until chapter 38, where he changes gears, and in the midst of this decline, as the nation of Israel is about to be wiped off the map and go into exile, as judgment is about to be brought upon him, he begins to proclaim a hope after judgment. From chapter 38 to 55, he elaborates on the promise made to Adam and to Noah and to Abraham and to Moses and to David. And he looks forward to one who will come to bring all people out of exile. Look with me at Isaiah 53, starting in verse 2. He grew up before him. The son grew up before the father like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering, who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised, and we did not value him. Yet he himself bore our sickness, and he carried our pain. We in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced with his large transgression, crushed because of our iniquity. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. We've all heard these words so many times before. 
are in danger of losing the contract that is here drawn. We are in danger of losing our grip on the greatest miracle ever performed. We are in danger, my dear brothers, of losing the full impact of the great example set before us. We grew up before you like a young plant and like a root of dry ground. I don't know how many of you have had experience in cultivating plants or farming. I was a farm boy. We planted many things in dry ground. When you plant something in dry ground, you have to provide for it every day because there is nothing there in the ground that could bring it up. And gee, what was there in this world that could bring forth one like Christ? Nothing. All he had was given to him outside of the world that he entered into. He did not have the impressive form or majesty that we should look at him. No appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of suffering who knew what sickness was. How often do we see Jesus rejected by the very ones who should have most rejoiced at his coming throughout our earthly ministry? There are too many passages for me to turn to all of them. There is no way I can do justice even to this one point. They turned away from him. I did it back then. And I still do today, did I not? We can all remember a time when we were the people mentioned in this verse who looked on Christ and saw nothing majestic, who looked on Christ and saw not an appearance that should be desired, we turned away. We rejected the one we now serve. We did not value him. Yet, he himself bore our sickness, and he carried our pain. He was faithful when we were unfaithful. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. We remained unfaithful. But he was pierced because of our transgressions, crushed because of our iniquity. Punishment for our peace was on him. He was faithful. We are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way. We were unfaithful. Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. Perhaps Isaiah here draws a contrast between the unfaithfulness of man and the faithfulness of God. And what astounds me, dear brothers, is this that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ knew these words and the truth of these words before ever he came, before the foundation of the earth were laid. He knew that we all like sheep would go astray. He knew that we would reject him. He knew that even when he came to give us the greatest gift that could be given, to make the greatest sacrifice that shall ever be made, to perform a miracle that could never be equaled, would yet despise him and turn each of us to our own way. Still he came. He knew we would not understand who he was as he came. He knew that we would not understand the word that he spoke and yet he came. He knew that we would not esteem him as we are yet he came. He knew that he would be humiliated by those who should have been humbled before him, and yet he came. He knew that though he himself could have no sin, the sins of all of us would be heaped 
upon him. And yet he came. He knew that he who could never die would die in the work way imaginable, and yet he came. Let us never forget this simple truth. We are always in danger of forgetting what is simple here. Because we are given here what is not simple. We are given what is complicated. We are caused to go into the minutia of doctrine and to split hair. And rightly so. But rather, I fear that very often we are in grave danger of losing sight of the forest. For all the trees. But we must remember why. Why? Because of what we are called to do. Are we not those who are called to imitate our Lord? Us more than others. For we are called to act as his ministers. Shepherds under the great shepherd trying to turn back all these sheep who, like us, have gone astray and are in danger of running past the barrier of God's word and over to the ravine into eternal damnation where they will drown forever in the fire of our Lord's holy wrath. We have been sent to stand in their way, to stand under the Lordship of Christ, to stand as he stood. If they hated our master, how much more so will they hate the sermon? If they would not hear our Lord, how much less will they hear us? I've been in ministry but a short time in this. I can tell you with all certainty that there will be seasons where you will be sent on your stiff neck and stubborn people with motive. And it will not matter what signs you perform or how you try to lead them. They will refuse to go. There will be times in your ministry when, like Isaiah, you will be called to a people who will not hear you. I am convinced of this about anything else, that all of us who are called to ministry will be, as the Apostle Paul was, shown what we must suffer for the sake of the gospel. And still we must persevere, as our Lord did. We must follow his example of humility, for this is humility that he who was equal with God did not think equality with God a thing to be grasped, but humbled himself, taking on the form of a man. He humbled himself to the point of death but death on the cross. How then can we do anything less? How then shall we do it? I believe this is how. We shall endure the trials and the tribulations by remembering the example of our Lord. We will recall in the hours of drought when it seems that we have been greatly afflicted and rejected, we shall recall what our Lord has done for us We shall look to the cross. And in looking to the cross, we will be pressed but not crushed. We shall be persecuted but never again. We shall be struck down, but we shall not be destroyed. We will endure by the spirit of him who endured what was rightfully our punishment. Let me pray for you. Father God, I'm not a very learned man, nor do I have any great grist and wisdom or skill in the proclamation of your word, Lord. I know what you have done for me. 
I know who I was when you saved me, Lord. I know that you gave me nothing by your hand. You gave me me. Lord, I know that in this life we will have sorrows. I know the only way to survive is to hold the cross, to hold the true life. Lord, I pray that we would not be ashamed to proclaim a simple message. I pray that we would not be ashamed to hold fast to such a simple truth. That we would not reject you. The example you set. That we would not forsake the true gospel for one with larger words, fancier terms, to cause us to appear more than we are. I pray that you have been glorified here today, Lord. I ask your forgiveness for where I have failed you, and your grace for where I have been. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.